Today we're going to be talking about pros leaving matches early. This is something which anyone who's played competitive StarCraft has experienced at some point. You've either done it yourself in a match where you've left when you thought the game was over and then you leave and you look at the replay and realize it was pretty even or maybe you were even ahead or you've seen your favorite pro gamer do this and obviously a pro match when there's money on the line players careers involved it's even more painful to watch that happen this is on my mind because just the other day in super tournament a player could have easily forced a draw and instead they left the game and they had a lot of time to realize that a draw was something that they could have forced and they just completely missed it. The commentators had kind of assumed that this was on the player's mind and he just left. But before we go into that, let's go back and explore the history of the just ridiculous amount of early leaves that go all the way back to StarCraft 2's early days. Let's go back to the very early days of 2011. I think this was MLG, Dallas, Idra vs. Huck, and probably the most famous moment that you can ever think of where a player left a game, not only where they left early and still had a chance to win, but they left a game that they had in the bag. Down. Now out on the field, and it looks like there's some Zerglings doing a counterattack in the main. The Void Rays, all hallucinations, doing absolutely no damage whatsoever. There's the blink up onto the high ground, just trying to distract Idra. Those hallucinated Void Rays almost fully charged, Wheat. And Idra left the game oh classic idra moment here this is the birth of the idra gg idra rage quit the game he didn't have detection in the fight he thought those were real void rays and they were going to overwhelm his corruptors even though we could see they were fighting for a few seconds and he should have realized he wasn't taking any damage from them but he was too upset at the fact that he'd been cheated out of yet another game because the Protoss player had managed to get off a bunch of units and it all played into his uh, pre-existing image about Zerg versus Protoss. I mean, this was so famous, so viral. The fact that this mechanic actually tricked someone out of a game they were winning, it was a wild moment. The best part of this was the chat log in the start of the next game where Huck, not being able to contain himself, decided to go in for the psychological stab, twist of the knife and uh, point out that the army was mostly hallucinated. Idra, of course, responded in typical Idra fashion. This, however, wasn't the only time the Idra GG came about. There was a bunch of times where he left games early and people would always claim it was an Idra GG, but nothing stood up to this moment right here up against the Korean champion MMA. 53. Yeah, and uh, where did that medevac go? I'm not sure he's taken out the old... Oh! Oh! Oh, oh! no! Oh! oh! So for those who can't, aren't too familiar, this is a map called Test Bug, and there's actually these rocks in the top of the screen. They're blocking you from mining the gold minerals. So MMA looked over there, told his army to attack the rocks, looked back at his base to do some macro, or at least that's what he thought he did. He accidentally clicked on the command center, and you can tell he glanced back and realized his mistake because he stopped the Marines from attacking it and quickly unseized his tanks to cancel it from attacking it, but they got the last volley off just in time and it died either way. Marcus, that is also not a good use of a third command center. No, it is not. No, it is not. The uh, Also, the medevac is about to get spotted. It is going to go down. He'll take out the Marines. No, he'll wait for the higher concentration of mutas. They are making their way over. He's going to try to engage this, and there are a lot of mutas out on the field right now. Another medevac will go down, and will MMA... Uh, it, I mean, ultimately be defeating himself here as that will put him behind. He needed that. A lot of Banelings being morphed right now. The Muta count is very high. This is a very tense point in the game because even though MMA has killed his third base and has uh, not started to rebuild it either, he's still got a giant Marine tank army spread through the middle of the map, slowly pushing the creep back and getting close to this fourth gold base of Idra. So Idra's got the fourth gold. MMA doesn't, but Idra doesn't know that. And basically, if you look at the game state, as long as Idra can break this one push, he should just be able to massively outproduce MMA and win the game. Idra has not lost, I do not even believe, a single, a single Muta in all this. And, uh, well, gosh, MMA moving forward, but Idra looks incredibly prepared for this. Another drop by MMA up at that expansion. I want to pause here for a moment, even rewind a second. Forward, but Idra looks incredibly prepared. Pay attention here. This drop up here is actually crucial. We found out after this game that this was very important because notice this drop came in idra boxed all of his workers and he told them all to go on this gas to pull them away from that but he actually must have just done that instinctively because in a moment's time he's going to forget that he's done that 
prepared for this. Another drop by MMA up at that expansion, trying to do a little bit of damage. And now Idris rolling in. Look at the mutilus count. Banelings getting absolutely obliterated by these tanks, but the mutilus count is just a little bit too high. Idris now streaming forward with Zerglings, Mutas, everything is overrunning this force by MMA. Wait, oh! what? What? Did Idra just leave another one game? Yes, yes he did, Sean. I think this is my favorite part about the whole thing, is his number one fan in the audience who's just had his heart broken right here. <laughs> you can see there's people like half clapping and just stunned in the audience. People look really just thrown off and confused and surprised by the whole thing. Uh, obviously they all thought, oh my God, he's actually winning. He's, he's winning the fight, he's winning the game. There's also this amazing one. Down here in the audience, we see this girl just turn in confusion and go, what did I just... <laughs> what did I just see? This one was especially painful because Idra, I believe, said after the fact that he thought he'd lost a whole base of workers and he thought MMA was still on three bases and he was effectively back on three bases of workers. So he kind of said, oh, you know what? Like, you know, I didn't... I lost most of my mutalisks in the fight. They're really expensive to replace. He still has Marines left alive. I'm going to lose to the follow-up push. Of course, he didn't know that MMA killed his own third command center, which is a freak occurrence. But even without knowing that, he thought he lost 20 drones here and they were all still alive. That's a huge mistake for him. And of course, for those wondering, well, couldn't he see that all the drones were there? Notice that only happens after he leaves the game. When he leaves the game, all the workers stop mining and they kind of blossom out. And that's why you're able to see that in the top right. So this is just a ridiculous situation, but it shows that in a you know, heightened state of awareness when you're playing a StarCraft game, it is so easy to lose your sense of what's going on. And for the fans, this was heartbreaking. And it just led even more into this sort of heel role of Idra where people wanted to cheer for him because he was one of the best non-Korean players who really, you know, held up the English-speaking community and at the same time seemed to not really care and give his all in these intense moments. I think people are a little unfair to Idra. They get really, you know, oh, what an idiot. Why would he leave these games? But I think people forget the context that this came from. And it's almost like understandable how Idra behaved if you think about Idra's attitude towards StarCraft 2. So Idra was one of the top Brood War players for StarCraft 1, and he really was banking on StarCraft 2 being popular and making a career out of it. So he was training for years to be at the top of his game, and from day one was grinding StarCraft 2, wanting to be one of the best players in the world. And he actually achieved that really quickly, but the thing that happened is it's like, cool, you're one of the best players in the world. Small problem, he didn't actually like the game. And for those who don't know, I mean, some people will be like, so what, you get to play video games, suck it up. But if you go from being someone who's going, you know, you're a StarCraft 1 pro gamer, earning next to no money, you're doing it purely out of passion. Suddenly, he sunk all this time into getting good at StarCraft 2. He's one of the best in the world. He's getting paid a lot of money. He's got so many fans. He's getting all these opportunities. But at the same time, he thinks that the game itself is deeply flawed and doesn't enjoy playing it. You can see why it's very easy for him when he gets in a hard position to just kind of go, ah, screw this, get upset and to leave the game without taking a moment to calm down or think about the big picture. The thing is, this isn't even in any way contained to just Idra, right? Idra has those two extremely viral examples of him leaving games early where you're like, oh my God, the drama, the chaos, the, you know, people are like, what the hell has happened? Why would you leave these games? What is going on? I mean, what the heck was going on in these matches? People lost their minds. But over the years since and all throughout StarCraft's history, it's always been a situation where, you know, pe the players lose track of what's going on in the game and sometimes they just throw in the towel either when they're actually ahead in the game or sometimes they just leave the game earlier than they should. So here we've got Cure vs. Ragnarok from Katowice during, I think it was the group stage of 2021, Group D, and Ragnarok actually does an amazing push here. Great, and Olsen would say, and that bile does look like, ooh, it gets pretty close to connecting. Yeah, very dangerous Biles here, but the SCV's pulled off the line. The Banshees are really the only hope, but of course there's an Overseer here, so those Cloak Banshees are not going to be as valuable as they otherwise would be. You can see both of them going down to Biles now, and this is absolutely crippling damage from Ragnarok, yeah. who's continuing to use links in the background, but with 32 SCVs down already, Grant, this looks deadly from Ragnarok. Kira is going to try and hold here his Marine count all the way up to 13, which is really nice, and he's going to be able to drive this back, but there's been significant economic damage done. So at this point, you can look at it, and most of the fans were saying, well... That didn't quite kill Cure, but it came very close. Cure is down to 16 SCVs versus 40 drones. Sounds terrible, but the Terran has three orbital command centers, 
two, uh, three barracks pumping out marines. Stim's about to finish. One, one upgrades. There's medevacs on the way. And there's a good army advantage of 11 army supply of basically much higher tech units. So the next few minutes, Kua has a much better army. He's going to be able to control the map with drops, go out there, put on pressure, do some damage. It is going to be hard for Ragnarok to catch up in tech. But he's up 24 workers. He's still definitely ahead on the economy, even if he's way behind on the tech. And he's a little behind on the army value at this moment. Even with three CCs, only 16 SCVs remaining. Mm -hmm. Cure is down. He might not be out, but he's mm -hmm. down. Grant, I do have to ask you a question, though. Y you said a moment ago that Ragnarok was going to break down the walls. Did you say Chris Jericho style? Yeah, man. Uh, wow. What the hell just happened? And he just leaves. I mean, this here is, is pretty unforgivable. I know people were shouting Idra GG in the forums and in the Twitch chat when this one happened. But it really is a game where, don't get me wrong, Cure has a very realistic chance of getting back in it and recovering in this game. That's just the way it works when you've cut all tech to do an attack like that and the Terran's already got his infrastructure and tech up. He has a chance of getting back in it, but Ragnarok was ahead. It's wild to see that Ragnarok was like, oh, I need to kill him. No, oh, I didn't do enough damage. And you know what? This definitely comes back to not realizing how many workers he killed. When his adrenaline was pumping, he probably didn't realize that he killed 41 workers. He probably thought, oh, there's probably still 30 workers. I only have about 40 workers. He's got triple mules in this army. There's no way I'm getting back in this game. Ah, oh, I'm screwed. Just throw in the towel. The problem with making this sort of assessment is, as always, you don't see everything in a StarCraft game. You just don't. You don't know what's going on in the shadows out there. There's so much that you might have misread because it's a game of limited information. You're, you're managing so many different tasks. It's easy to lose track of what's going on. That's exactly what's happened here. So this next one, we're looking at Serral. And this is not as crazy a situation as that last game. But I think we see the same sort of mindset from Serral as Ragnarok showed. And I think it's just dangerous because there are moments in StarCraft where you're looking somewhere else. You don't realize you killed an extra five or six workers or you've misjudged how much economy or workers or army your opponent has in the game. It's the way limited information works. So I always like to see players sticking in there and fighting it out. But I think more recently we've seen Serral visibly getting frustrated and upset as the games aren't going his way. We've seen him, you know, reacting more in his camera and... That's not just for him. This is for all players. And I always see a high correlation between players who are visibly upset when things don't go their way and leaving these games rather than hanging in there and fighting it out just a little bit more. Don't get me wrong. He probably was going to lose this game. There's a lot of Marines and Medivacs out. He's probably going to lose most of these Ravages and he's only up a handful of workers. But he's got some creep spread. You've got Defender's Advantage. There's a long map. As a fan, I definitely like to see him play it out and at the very least put some pressure on his opponent. All right, so this is the game which has really brought my attention to this topic and made me think about it. In this game, Dark's up 1-0 and it is a nail-biting 55-minute game on Waterfall where every single resource has been mined out. These are their last armies, just a handful of units for both sides where every single unit matters. Only a couple of Broodlords left in the skies, bunch of Infestors and Queens and Dark gets an incredible fight here. Neuroparasites are held out, baits Cure forward and starts landing some killer fungals taking out most of the Hellbats, most of the small units, which is going to make it very hard for Cure to fight this out. The real big thing here is the GG. And the casters themselves were absolutely flabbergasted. You can see Dark with a big smile. Cure looks a little frustrated up there. And you can hear State and Tasteless had been talking for a long time about how Dark, if you look at the units tab in the top left, had no units that shoot up other than Queen's. And at any point, Cure could lift a building, hide it in the dead space on the edge of the map, and force a draw. Yet somehow, Cure forgot this. I think he was so angry off these fungals, he just completely forgot that was an option. Fungals, and I think, you know, now the question is, is Cure just... You're no! kidding. No! You are kidding me. Nothing can kill Crazy a lifted end, building! But at the same time, the worst episode of Game of Thrones I've ever seen. All he had to do was lay a float a building over the vacant area but you know what dark dark it's kind of crazy i'm I... not that's a frustrating way to lose all he needed to do was do that and the thing is they'd been in a stalemate -ish scenario for a long time they both knew the map was mined out there's no reason why you're fighting against just four broodlords 15 queens and seven infestors like that's that's a wild army people only use an army like that at this little hodgepodge of units when you're both completely mined out and with no corruptors left and he was scanning the map as well he should have known this and this is where I think there's a habit of staying in the game can be so powerful, even if it feels like you're staying in a bit longer than people think you should.
And so who the hell do we talk about when we talk about players staying in the game way too long to the point where the community, their opponents, other pros, and just about everybody make fun of them incessantly? Fantasy. That's the Terran player in this clip up against Sue from a GSL tournament back in 2015. Now, a lot of people in StarCraft, obviously you need to eliminate all the buildings to technically win the game because that can take forever. Usually you leave when you think there's no chance to win anymore. And if you stay beyond a certain point where people think there's no chance, then they will get angry. They'll call you bad-mannered. Uh, people in the community would get so frustrated that the chat, whenever Fantasy was playing, would just be filled with people making, being like, what, what is he doing? This is so, so disgusting, this behavior. This is really offensive to his opponents. It's so disrespectful. And a lot of people would say that, but I really feel like the more I've watched people leave games and give up opportunities to win over the years, the more I'm realizing more and more that it's like, hey, what does it cost you? You stay in the game for an extra minute or two. Maybe it's not great for the audience, but it costs you nothing. And sometimes it gives you time to calm down, process, and realize that there's something in the game that still gives you a chance to win. And it's fantastic practice for that and for keeping yourself in the moment focused rather than getting dragged out of the moment. And that's exactly what Fantasy did here. He would always famously stay in the game until almost all of his buildings were eliminated, but look what he pulls off here. Kill the hatchery. Kill the hatchery. Just go over to the hatchery. It looks like he is flying that way. Look at this. A Viking's gonna try once again to deal with his overseer. Oh, he got it with the Marines. There's no detection left. There's no detection. He can go for the hatchery. He does that. He has more than enough energy to do it too, I think. So this was wild. That overseer, the thing is, Sue had an unkillable army, but he's only got enough money for this hatchery left in his base trade. If the hatchery dies, he is eliminated, whereas Fantasy still has a lot of buildings, even though he has no army left. All he's got is one Banshee with Cloak. And you see that purple bar? That's its energy. That energy drains the longer it's cloaked. So it needs to kill this hatchery before it's cloaked. But not just that, and I'm not sure if you realize that at this point, but there's also a spine crawler, which is walking around the map, which he's going to need to eliminate as well. And this was one of the craziest moments for, me, for my memory in all of StarCraft 2 because I remember being one of the players who was almost annoyed at Fantasy for how long he stayed in games and was very critical of it until I saw this game and it completely changed my mind about it. And I realized that my impatience as a viewer meant nothing compared to Fantasy's right as a competitor to stick it out and look even for a 0.1% chance of victory. You know, in my memory, I knew it was close. I forgot that it was actually this close. The Banshee is actually behind me right now. Let me, let me, let me move myself. I'm gonna hide myself from the camera. Look at the energy on that Banshee. Three, two, just about to tick down to one energy and he kills the last building. And all of those many extra hours he spent in games grinding out, looking for the win, trying to find any sort of advantage he can finally paid off in that moment. If we go back now to the GSL Super Tournament 2020, we're going to look at one last series to show another example of what can happen if you hang into a game even when things go terribly. It's Maru vs. Sola. <gasps> it might see the second Wait. SCV coming. Oh, oh my The SCV God. began to have a seizure uh, on the rocks. He sees it. He sees it. He just cancels two drones. Pool coming. Oh, oh he sees this. Yeah, it does. You're it. such a bias caster. Uh oh, he's so good. Look at how his SCV randomly went to the left. There's a lot of RNG in that. Mario just keeps putting on. He's like, come on, one time. <laughs> well, okay. This is not looking Maybe too this hot. one SCV will finish these two barracks. Oh, no. Oh, no. There's bad starts, and then there's this. This is basically game over. Any pro will tell you this is such a terrible start. Yes, Solar lost some mining, but to have both barracks stop building and losing both SCVs, this is appalling for Maru. But what I love about Maru is he's one of the most calm players when he's behind. He shows responses. But they're about as light as they get. Pay attention to his camera next to me. Watch it, watch it. And as the last SCV dies, a slight puckering of the lips. And then he just keeps playing the game. And that is emblematic of Maru's responses in general. This is what I love about Maru, but also about Reyna, uh, Dark, Hero. These are the players who I feel like I very rarely see them get thrown off. And I'm not saying they don't have bad days where they do get upset and, and leave games early and that sort of stuff. But most of the time, 
they just look completely calm and unperturbed no matter what's happening in the game. And they just keep playing it out and trying to defend through these scenarios. Even here, at this point, Maru's built such a legendary uh, reputation. You can even listen to it in the way Artosis and Tasteless are talking about this scenario where he's already in a terrible spot and now his main is getting broken into by Ravages. Sorry, this is all part of Maru's plan. Yeah, no, he's got, now he's going to trap these in here and then win the game. Oh. It's all part of Maru's plan. He's going to trap these in here and win the game. I mean, obviously they're joking. Tastos is one of the funniest casting duos out there. But it really is that thing where he'd made so many comebacks over the years up to this point that people, you know, the other meme they had was like, you know, if you're ahead, if you're behind versus Maru, uh, you're dead. If, if you're even, you're actually behind. And if you're ahead, you're even. In other words, you're never ahead versus Maru. He's just that good. To be honest, though, I just think this speaks to something else about overall the mindset, which I think we should all probably be looking to learn from this. And it's, it's not about winning every game. Like there will be games where you are actually 100% dead and arguably you should leave the game. But the real point here is that you can't know that in the game. In the game, you have limited information. You're, mu you're multitasking, you're managing many tasks. And so your best safest bet as a competitor is to stay in the game and play it out. You have nothing to lose by doing this, right? A lot of players are like, oh, but it's too frustrating. It's too exhausting. And that's the thing is that's that's only if your mindset is, oh my God, I screwed up, I screwed up and you're torturing yourself over it. What's really exhausting about playing a game that you're already behind in is if you're so busy getting upset about your previous mistakes, you can't even focus in the moment on adjusting. Look at Reyna when he's playing a situation from behind with a big fat smile on his face. Look at Maru with his just calm, dedicated, focused defense. And you start to see that they really just say, look, I'm probably gonna lose this game, but if I win, it'll be really epic. So, you know, it's not, oh my God, I screwed up. This is terrible. It's, oh my God, I screwed up. Accepting that in the moment and finding a way to just kind of go, okay, so what can we do to turn this from a 1% win, percent, win percentage chance to a 10% or 20%? What gambles do I need to take if I'm rain or a dark? Maybe I need to just go super turtle would be Maru style and just try to turtle out and see if I can make some miraculous defenses of some pushes. Exactly what he's doing right here. I think just looking at the way Maru just keeps calmly playing his game from this appallingly bad situation where he's at about half of the supply for most of this game, it's so inspirational to me because it just reminds me that like, hey, wait a second, when I'm having my best days on the ladder, even not playing for money, not playing tournaments, I'm actually having fun, fun losing games as well as winning because no matter what goes wrong, I'm kind of just accepting the situations I'm in and, and just finding ways to play around them. And I'm finding the joy in playing the game in all of its different circumstances. Days, on the other hand, when I'm feeling angry and upset and every mistake that goes wrong feels like a disaster, you know, it feels like I just fall apart mentally. And I see that reflected in what I would say is probably the norm for a lot of pros out there, where when things aren't going right, they do seem to fall apart a little bit. We've seen players like Creator have all sorts of wild breakdowns and just get so visibly upset. Whereas guys like Maru on the other side here, just amazing, rock solid in such high pressure scenarios. We can watch here and see the final stages of Maru just sealing the deal on a comeback after losing two proxy barracks at the start of the game. Absolutely ridiculous that he was able to do this. Did I say Banelings? I meant, I meant never mind. Um, oh, he throws some good vials down, but he's lost basically all the Banelings. The tanks are still sitting here shelling. Oh, he's actually surrounded. This is 360 degrees of Maru, GG. He has Marauders unburrowing underneath the Ravagers to shoot them at this point. Uh, look, at, look at Solar's yeah. face. He's like, okay, okay. Maru showing literally no reaction as always. He's just like, just another game, bro. And of course, as we get to the end of it, Maru is not going to show us much reaction at all. Super chilled out. He's like, oh yeah. No, just playing the game. Solar, of course, on the other hand, looking visibly frustrated. That is just, that's just it. Just play like Maru. All right, as cool as it is to see these amazing god tier comebacks that you can occasionally pull out if you're used to playing from behind and hang out in the game, nine times out of 10, you'll probably still be losing those games. Not just that, but as much as we from the sidelines as casters and observers can see everything, the players can't. And so it is actually very forgivable and understandable that players do often leave games without realizing that there was a path to victory, which we clued on too much earlier. That doesn't make us in any way smarter than them, and they're still way better players than most of us will ever be. The big lesson that I'm taking away from going down this little journey, looking through these games, looking through old ones, more recent ones, just thinking about this whole kind of phenomenon that always pops up for people leaving games too early. For me, it's learning the, just this idea that 
if I'm feeling a need to instantly leave the game when things aren't looking like they're going my way 100%, it's probably a sign that I'm a bit too obsessed on the outcome of the game, win or lose, or I'm too angry at myself for one of the mistakes I've made earlier in the game rather than just accepting the mistake and moving forward. And so I think for me, the goal is to try to just accept where I am in the game and play from there because I know that when I'm able to stay in the moment and keep playing, I actually enjoy losing quite a bit. Not as much as winning. Don't get me wrong. I won't lie to you guys, but it, I, I will enjoy it a fair bit. So I would love to be able to just flick that switch and just calmly play through any situation like a Maru or a Reina and just find a way to always make these comebacks happen. Now that's way easier said than done. I know realistically, I had a, a really tilting ladder session the other day where I was getting really upset and leaving games uh, angrily and not really processing what was happening very well. But at least I've got a goal in mind and I think I've got a few more signs, leaving games a bit early, leaving them suddenly, and also kind of being angry at previous mistakes in the game rather than in the moment are all going to be warning signs for me from now on that I should probably not focus on the outcome of the game, but just focus on playing out the situation that I'm in in that moment. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope this was interesting to you, taking a look at some of these past games. I'd love to hear everyone's stories out there about times where they've made amazing comebacks or where they've left a match too early and not realize they actually could have won. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you in the next episode. If you want to check out other videos about StarCraft, click on one of these on screen and we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye and good night. Don't know what the pointing, pointing, saluting, nah, outros.